So we're going to read verses 1 through 19, and then read one verse in uh, verse 28. Follow with me as I read. Now, there's a prophet in here, and I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce his name. I've pronounced it one way all my life. So if I did it wrong, don't come up to me and say, you pronounced that name wrong. Just just be quiet and let me just pronounce the way I want to, okay? All right? You pronounce the way you want to, and then when we get to heaven, we'll talk to his mother to see how it was supposed to be pronounced, okay? Anyway, all right, here we go. Ready? And they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria? And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to the battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. <clears throat> then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about four hundred men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides, that we might inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten hither, Micaiah, the son of Imla. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria. All the prophets prophesied before them. And all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Chenaena, made him horns of iron and said, Thus saith the Lord, With these shalt thou push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. I love his answer. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. And he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord deliver, shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I hear thee, that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jeho- to Jehoshaphat, Did not I tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand. And on his left. And then go down to verse 28. And Micaiah said, If thou return it all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the word of God. Help us tonight to listen carefully to what you're going to say. I pray that we would be challenged. I pray that we would uh, be instructed and we would decide we're going to follow exactly what you say uh, tonight. Please uh, help us not be distracted. And I pray at the invitation time we make the proper decision in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I can't do either one of them. <laughs> but <clears throat> praise the Lord for that. Thank you, Maureen. First Kings chapter 22, verse number 19. I want to remind you again that next, next Sunday I will be in Missouri uh, preaching at my daughter's uh, church. Her husband's going to be ordained. It's not my daughter. She's not the pastor of the church. She goes to that church. But uh, anyway, she, uh, he, he's going to be ordained to the ministry on Monday night. And so they've asked me to come out. And help with that. So I'm going to go out there, and then next Sunday, Brother Kevin will preach in the morning, and Brother Pierce will preach at night. So please be in your place. That would be a blessing. Uh, but anyway, First Kings 22, verse 14. I'm going to talk to you about, uh, <clears throat> as the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. I'm going to talk to you about <clears throat> about that subject tonight, and I want you to. We're going to talk about the responsibility that a preacher has. Uh, when he when he's uh, called to preach from God, and I'm thinking it's going to help you, but also we're going to talk about your responsibility. I have responsibility. We got here. We got this book right here, okay? And right here, you and me are. I'm, we, this book stands between you and me. I have responsibility, and you have responsibility. Right. 
And we're going to talk about that tonight. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. Help us tonight to listen. And thank you for all the preaching that we have heard <clears throat> in the last few weeks. We, it's just great to, to um, have this op- these opportunities. I thank you for the great men of God we've got to meet and hear. Pray to help us now to listen carefully to the truth tonight and apply it to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I get excited when I think about Liberty Baptist Church. I was thankful for the testimony some people gave tonight about it. I get excited when I think about the spiritual growth that I'm seeing in the many of the people. I get excited when I see and hear the people being saved. I was excited last night when I found out that two girl, the two girls got saved after the youth activity. I get excited at the baptisms. I get excited when I see the altars filled with Christians making holy decisions every service. I don't know about you, but Tuesday night when this place, the altar, was just absolutely full, I was excited about that. That gets me excited to see Christians responding uh, to the preaching of God's Word. I get excited when I see the bus pull away on Sunday morning, except for today when the bus didn't start, and return with souls who will be taught the Word of God. I get excited to watch all the godly men and women stand behind the pulpit and sing uh, these songs about the Savior. <clears throat> and uh, they, they truly love who they're singing about, and I appreciate that. That means a lot to me. But all that I get excited about, nothing excites me any more than to stand behind this pulpit and preach the Word of God, preach the wonderful truths that God shows me in this book, the King James Bible, the King James Bible, the perfect, preserved Word of God. Now, <clears throat> by the way, uh, you got to hear a man preach Tuesday night, uh, Monday and Tuesday night, who has fought more for the, for the King James Bible than probably any man in America. He stood and fought for the, for the King James Bible and has really endured a lot, of, a lot of stuff because of that. But anyway, I'm excited to preach the, the King James Bible because it's the Word of God. It's the perfect, uh, pure Word of God, the only perfect English Bible that there is. Now, you know the main reason I I get excited about all this is because I get to speak what the Lord tells me to speak. Okay, I don't get up here and preach Richterology or Baptistology, if that's even a word, or or the thought of some theologian of the past or present. I get to preach the truth of the Word of God. And I get to say what McCann said, whatever the Lord tells me to speak, that's what I'm going to speak. And I promise you, when I get behind this pulpit, I'm going to tell you, what God wants me to tell you. I'm not going to tell you what I want to tell you. I'm going to tell you what God wants me to tell you. Now, <clears throat> here, you see, and by the way, that's why the liberals don't want to come. Because they don't want to hear, thus saith the Lord. That's why the queers won't come. You say, that's a mean name to call. I have no respect for that, for those kind of people. No respect for that kind of lifestyle at all. To me, it's a queer lifestyle. It's, queer used to mean odd and weird. And that's exactly what that is. When a man kisses a man, when a woman kisses a woman, uh, in, in the, just like a man would kiss a woman, but when they do that, that's queer, that's weird. Okay? And, but they don't want to come here because they don't want to hear, thus saith the Lord. The rebels won't come here because they don't want to hear what the, what the Lord says. But thank God, I said, thank God that, that there is a group of people who want the preacher to speak what the Lord says. Thank God for the people of Liberty Baptist Church. And I think, I think that tonight you'll get a blessing from what we're going to talk about. But again, we're going to use our Bibles a lot. We're going to turn to passages of scriptures and read them. And, and just talking about the preacher and his responsibility to preach the word of God. In our story, Ahab, the king of Israel, was, was, uh, was trying to get God's man to tell him what he wanted to hear. Did you t- catch that in that story? He wanted the preacher to tell him what he wanted to hear. Now, here's how the story goes. Verses 1 through 4, Ahab wants to capture a city from the Syrians and comes to ask Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, at at that time, for help. Verse 5, Jehoshaphat tells Ahab to find out what God says about what they are to do. By the way, that's why we read our Bibles. That's why we come to church. We want to find out what God says about what we are to do. In verse 6, Ahab gets his false prophets, and that's like going to a false church, and he gets them (coughs) uh, to tell him, What he wants to hear. But that's not good enough for Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat wants to hear what God's man has to say. Ahab hates God's man because God's man always tells him the truth about his life. Jehoshaphat wants to hear the preacher preach the truth. That's what he wants. So they sit and listen, in verses 10 through 12, to to these false prophets. Ahab's messenger tries to lay guilt a guilt trip on God's man. He says, now everybody else is telling the king everything's going to be fine, so make sure you tell him that too. Everybody else is is preaching unto him smooth things. Make sure you do too. Don't rock the boat. Okay, don't make him feel uncomfortable. But God's man does what God's man should do. 
he stands his ground and says, I'm going to tell you, tell him what God tells me to tell him. In John 12, 50, John chapter 12, verse 50, the Bible says here, Jesus said this, he said, I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Whatever the Father tells me, that's what Jesus said. Whatever the Father tells me, that's what I'm going to speak. Then, then he tell, the prophet tells Ahab what Ahab wants to hear, but Ahab knows it's not for real. He says, okay, Ahab, I'll tell you, you're going to go, and God's going to bless you, and everything's going to be hunky-dory. He's kind of toying with Ahab. And Ahab <coughs> says, I want, he says, now listen, I want the truth. I want the truth. He demands that the prophet tell him the truth. And so verses 17 through 23, the prophet tells him the truth. Now, of course, you know what happens. The false preachers get mad and, and intimidated, as they always do when a preacher with guts uh, tells is in their midst. They get mad and they get intimidated. Verses 25 through 28, God's man is put in prison for speaking the truth. <clears throat> now, by the way, if that ever happens to me, let it be said I was put there for speaking the truth. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about what Micaiah, Micaiah said to, to the king. Whatever he says to me, and I'm paraphrasing, that's what I'm going to say. Whatever he tells me to say, that's what I'm going to say. You should stand for nothing less in this pulpit, ever. When anybody stands to preach God's word, it should always be, what does God want said? Now, <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, if you look at this. Jeremiah chapter 20, again, use your Bibles. We're going to be turning a lot to different passages of Scripture. We're going to read different verses. And, um, by the way, you say, well, you're really fast. You, go through, you get to these verses fast. Uh, 35 years ago, I didn't get to the verses fast. 35 years ago, you know, this was this is me in the pew when the preacher said, turn to this passage, turn, this is me. And this is me to my wife, or, or to people that I knew. He goes too fast. Well, how, how am I able to get there quick now? From years of turning. Experience. Experience, you see. So don't get frustrated with me when I give you all these verses. You ought to be glad because I'm teaching you where to find, how to find books of the Bible. Okay, so that's how I got to find all, learn how to find all the books of the Bible, was through my pastor using a lot of scripture when he preached. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, he said, the preacher says, Then said I, I will not make mention of him or speak any more in his name. I'm not going to preach anymore. <clears throat> but look at what a God-called preacher, what happened to the God-called preacher. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. I could not stay quiet. I had to preach. A God-called preacher has to preach. If you want to see the most miserable Christian in the world, I always thought the most miserable Christian in the world was a backslidden Christian. But you know what? The most miserable Christian in the world is not a backslidden Christian. The most miserable Christian in the world is a preacher who's not preaching. You, you just let, let God show you one day. Uh, he probably videotapes it because God videotapes us. You know, he watches us so he can show us on videotape how foolish we look sometimes. But anyway, um, let him show you 19, 2008, 2010 in my life. You'll see the most miserable person that you ever saw in your life <clears throat> because I wasn't preaching. I, I, I love church. And I got a lot, I got a, a lot of what my pastor was saying. But, man, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, I mean every Sunday, He's up there preaching, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm supposed to be up there. I mean, I'm supposed to be preaching. I'm not supposed to be sitting in these pews. I'm supposed to be preaching. Because a preacher has to preach. He has to preach. And it's really, really important to, that he does that. In Acts chapter 4, verse 20, the, the apostle said, We cannot help but, but speak what we've seen and heard. We've got to, we can't help it. We've got to say something. We've got to preach God's word. Now, <clears throat> who tells me what to say? And this is the truth about every real man of God. You're going to see in the Bible who tells the man of God what to say. So I don't understand why people get mad at the pastor, except for the fact they don't understand who told them to say that. You know, nobody, nobody really, that, okay, Christian, I'm a Christian. I love people. I like to make people happy. I like people to like me. I've never liked people being mad at me. I never have. <clears throat> um, so why in the world would I say some of the things I say up here? Why would I preach some of the things I preach? I know they're going to make people mad. Why would I do that? It's not my idea. I guarantee you it's not my idea. I like to get up here and go, everything's fine. It's great. 
You're all wonderful. You're all wonderful. Everything you did this week was great. It was wonderful. God bless you as you drank your beer. God bless you as you smoked your cigarettes and your drugs. And God bless you as you watched your dirty, filthy movies. Oh, <clears throat> God bless you. And pat you on the back and say, boy, I'll tell you what. Love, 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 love. It would be so much easier to do that. Why in the world would I want to say things that are going to stir people up and get them upset? Because a God called preacher has to say what God might say. He has to. He has no choice. In, in Numbers chapter 16, verse 28, Moses said, Hereby ye shall know what that the Lord has sent me to do all these works. For I have not done them of mine own mind. See that? When I, when I read that, uh, I said, man, amen, Moses, that's so true. <clears throat> I have not done them <coughs> of mine own mind. This isn't my idea. It's not my idea that I'm up here ha- preaching and pastoring, I- I'm speaking in front of people. That's not my idea. This isn't me, folks. Me is sitting in the back row uh, in the corner and just having my Bible there and listening and then going home. That's me. I'm just a real quiet guy. I don't like I don't like be around crowds. I don't like to meet new people. That's me. You see, but God did something to me after I got saved. He put something in my heart that has totally changed all that. And so this is not done of my own mind. I did not make this up. I did not uh, devise this plan for my life. The la- I'll tell you, when I got saved, if God would make. The day I got saved, God would have said, okay, here's a list of the things I would like for you to do, or you could possibly do with your life, you could possibly do. <clears throat> the preacher, being a preacher would have been the last thing I'd have picked. The last thing. Because that meant standing in front of people. And I stand in front of people, and oh, oh, I get so nervous. I get so nervous. And, but you see, and God changed all that. So this isn't of my own mind. Go to Isaiah chapter 48, verse 16. Isaiah 48, verse 16. We're just going to look into the minds uh, and the mentality of, of, a, of a man of God tonight and see what the Bible has to say. Uh, Isaiah 48, verse 16. Isaiah said, Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was. There am I. And now the Lord God and His Spirit has sent me. So <clears throat> Isaiah is saying, Come near to me. Near to me. I'm not going to hide anything. The Lord God has sent me. I didn't send myself. God sent me. You see that? God sent me. By the way, I think this is true Uh, in any church when they're looking for a pastor. uh, A church is looking for a pastor. ought to make sure that God sent that man. I don't think, myself, that, that an unspiritual person has any right to vote for a pastor. I don't think that at all. See? I think if any if anything needs to be written in constitutions of churches, it needs to be, be the procedure to elect a new pastor. I think it is so amazing that worldly people are entrusted with with with, with, with uh, electing a man of God or choosing a man of God for their church. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. It ought to be the people that are reading their Bible and the people that are praying and the people that are on their face. The people that are walking with God. The people that are living a holy life. The people that get, can get in touch with God. Those are the ones that are qualified to vote to call a new pastor. <clears throat> so anyway, it, it, it should be that God has sent the man, not the man was sent himself or the people wanted him. No, it ought to be God. It ought to be God's choice. Look at Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 4. The Lord has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. See that? The Lord has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. God sent them. But you have not hearkened or inclined your ear to hear. <clears throat> See, <clears throat> I am not serving him. I am not serving my, I, I mean, I'm serving my, serving my God, not my own interests. I'm not serving me. I'm serving him. God is the one that sent me. I didn't send myself, you see. So if God sent me, then I need to make sure I say what God said. And if God sent me, you need to make, make sure you listen to it. Look at Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 5. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 5. It's just a lot, a lot of written in the Bible about, about the, the messenger of God. 
Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 5, And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord. See that? Thus saith the Lord. <clears throat> Not thus saith, just tell him what you think. No, thus saith the Lord. So a Spirit-filled preacher is going to say, Thus saith the Lord. So it is not, thus saith the, the, man, the, uh, <coughs> the, the man, no, it's thus saith the Lord. So that's why, so if who's ever speaking behind this pulpit and brings a Bible and is, is preaching God's word, we need to take it as thus saith the Lord, not thus saith the man. It is not the message of the man, it is the message of God. Now you say, well, I'm not sure you always preach what God tells you to preach. Then what are you doing here? I mean, man, really. What are you doing here? You need to go somewhere where you are sure that whatever the man, that man says, it's, it's God's message. It's thus saith the Lord, not thus saith the man. Now, I'll tell you, my spiritual life is too important to me. My walk with God is too important to me. <clears throat> One day I've got to stand before God and answer to him for my life, so I want to make sure I get the proper instruction from God on how to live my life, and I'm going to get the proper instruction from God on how to live my life from a God-called man who's going to tell me, Thus saith the Lord. Look at Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> And the Bible says here in verse number 20, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 20, says here, <clears throat> Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private in interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. See, we speak not by our will, but as the Holy Ghost moves us. You see, as the Holy Ghost moves us, not as what we want to say, it's what does the Holy Ghost tell us to say. Numbers 23, let me read it, you don't have to turn there, but verse 26 says, And Balaam answered and said unto Balak, Told not I thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh, that I must do. You see, <clears throat> don't blame the preacher for preaching something that you don't like. It's God that sent him. It's God that called him. It's God that wants you to hear this. He's just the messenger. That's all I am. Look at Numbers chapter 24, verse 13. Numbers 24, verse 13. Numbers 24, verse 13. The Bible says here, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of mine own mind. But what saith what the Lord saith, that will I speak. Balaam says, I can't I can't go beyond what God says. I can't tell you of my own mind. It doesn't matter how much money you pay me, I cannot be bought. I'm not gonna tell you anything but by but by what God tells me to say. That's what I'm gonna say. What the Lord saith, that will I speak. Man, that's the way it ought to be. <clears throat> what he says, that's what I'm going to say. Numbers 23, 5. Numbers 23, 5 says, and The Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return unto Balak, and thus thou shalt speak. The Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and told him what to say, just like the Lord puts words in our mouth and tells him, tells us what to say. I'm convinced when Brother Pierce testified before, how God changed the message for the kids this morning. That was a God thing, no doubt about it. God told him, if God's in control, the man, listen, I can study, I can prepare, and I can be all set, ready to go, uh, and right with this mess that's going on. If God wants me to change it, i got to change it. Right. But God, I didn't study for what you're telling me to say. I don't have anything prepared that way. It doesn't make any difference if I told you to preach that, you get up and preach that. Right. See, it's not my idea, it's not, it's not my thoughts that I'm going to stand here and give you. I'm going to tell you what God says. So important. Go to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. To the law and to the testimony. 
if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. False preachers don't preach this way. They don't preach what God says because there is no light in them. The light is Jesus Christ. They don't have the light of the world in them, and that's why they don't tell the truth. That's why they can stand behind pulpits with Bibles in their hand and just say anything they want to say. I've heard some incredible things come out of so-called preachers' mouths. Some incredible things. You wonder, wonder where in the world they get that. They certainly didn't get that from the Bible. And they do it. They stand up and do it. They, 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 uh, take, they take, get paid good money to tell you what they think. It's amazing. Psalm 140, verse 11. They're not going to tell me what they think. I don't want to hear what they got to say. Psalm 140, verse 11. I want to hear what God says. Psalm 140. You know, for 23 years I heard what man told me. <clears throat> Man represented God for me. He told me what he thought. I want to hear what God says. Psalm 140, verse 11. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. God says, don't let them be established. When I thought about that, I thought, you know, that's, that's so true. We as Christians cannot let an evil preacher be established in our lives. Okay, I remember one time I, I stood up and I, and I was preaching. And I was preaching against this person, this radio preacher. I mentioned his name. By the way, I believe in mentioning names because it's my job as your overseer, as your pastor, as your shepherd, to lead you away from people that are not going to tell you the truth. Uh, I had a guy, okay, I, one of the guys came in our church the other day, mentioned how he had went to hear, uh, a long time ago, went to hear Chuck Swindoll. I said, did you know Chuck Swindoll? I believe it's okay to have an occasional drink. Did you know that? I didn't feel a bit bad telling him that, because I don't want him listening to him. That's why I tell you that John MacArthur believes doesn't, doesn't believe the blood of Jesus is not necessary for salvation. I'm going to tell you that, okay? And so I was up preaching about this guy, this one guy, and and um, and he's a really big family guy. He does some kind of focus uh, focus show, and and I was telling ta- you know what I'm, who I'm talking about probably if you listen to the radio at all. But anyway, uh, and he came up to me after church, and he was really ripping me for criticizing this guy. And this guy believes you can lose your salvation. I mean, and I'm thinking, you're, you're criticizing me for pointing out a false prophet to you? I just did what the Bible said to do, that's all. You see, I don't want an evil speaker to be established in your mind. Where you're going to say, boy, I like this guy. Now, he doesn't always say everything that's right. Well, if he doesn't always say everything that's right, what are you listening to him for? you got so many opportunities to hear God's word. Why would you waste it on a guy that's not going to tell you the truth? Or a guy you're not sure is telling you the truth. Look at Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13 and verse number 3. <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 13 and verse number 3. says here, and it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesied. It shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed every one of his vision when he hath prophesied. Neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. So he's saying here that if, you, if the prophet pre- preaches lies... He's not going to live. Now, that's one of the many verses that I read that thought, I thought, wow, what an awesome responsibility I have as a preacher. God's watching. God's listening to these sermons. God's hearing me preach. I better tell the truth. I better preach what God says. I better rightly divide the word of truth. I better make sure I do that because I have to answer to God one day for what I say. And if I'm up here preaching a bunch of lies, God is, you may not realize it, and if you're reading your Bible, you will. You may not realize that I may be able to fool you, but I can't fool him, and I'm going to be in big trouble. It's an awesome responsibility. It's something that we ought to be, we ought to be excited about doing it for God called preachers, but we ought to tremble also, saying this, this is huge, this is big. Now, let me try to show you what I ought to speak. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. The message, what it ought to be. What, what message should be coming forth from the man of God? First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 says, 
Paul said, here, here, we were, as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God was trying our hearts. So, the first thing that I'm responsible for preaching is the gospel. I ought to be, I ought to be preaching the gospel. I ought to be telling people <coughs> how to be saved from the pulpit. We ought to be mentioning the plan of salvation from the pulpit. People ought to have an opportunity to be saved uh, from what they hear from the pulpit. Be invited to be saved or get a clear plan of salvation. But the preacher ought to preach the gospel. Now, really, church really is for the believer. All right? It's the, uh, it doesn't command, nowhere in the Bible is it commanded un, an unbeliever to go to church. Uh, but it does command the believer to go to church. So we are commanded to go to church, but people can, we know how it goes. You go out and you, and you, you live your life, you invite people to church, you witness, you, people come to church because you, you, you met them, and, and unsaved people walk in off the street here, and so you've got to give them the opportunity to be saved. So preaching the gospel is essential. And there are sometimes people who play church, and they're really not saved. So people ought to have an opportunity to hear the gospel message. It ought to be everywhere we go. It ought to be in our church, too. So it's the pastor's responsibility to preach the gospel. Then go to Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 14. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 14. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 20, verse 14 says... But then upon Jezeel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, so the Spirit of God comes upon him, he goes to the congregation, and he says, Hearken ye all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. So this man of God stands in front of these people, and he gives them, he preaches to them what God said, and they were words of encouragement. The battle's not yours, but God's. And so the man of God is responsible not only to preach the gospel, but also to offer words of encouragement to the people. God wants his people encouraged. He doesn't want his people discouraged. He wants to preach about God's love and God's patience and God's forgiveness, and God's desire to use you, and all kinds of other good things about God, and what He is what He is to us, and what He'll do for us. We ought to be preaching words of encouragement. That's part of our responsibility. You see. You need to be encouraged. You need to be encouraged. Even when the preacher's preaching against sin, the preacher ought to say, okay, now here's the remedy. Yeah, pre- point out the sin, we're going to get to that in a second, but give the remedy to it. Give a solution to the problem. I mean, sin, I just heard a message about sin. I found out that this particular sin is a problem in my life. Praise God, the pastor gave me the solution to the problem. I can walk out of here not feeling like a guilty, wicked, hopeless sinner. I can walk out of here with hope because I can, that problem can be fixed in my life. That's encouraging. Go to Second Chronicles 24, 20. Second Chronicles 24, verse 20. Second <clears throat> Chronicles 24, 20. <clears throat> And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Why transgress ye the commandment of the Lord, which ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. Another one of my responsibilities is to to give words not only of encouragement, but words of rebuke. I am to preach words of rebuke. I am to get behind this pulpit and tell you, shame on you for being unfaithful. Shame on you for not walking with God. Shame on you for not not serving the Lord. Words of rebuke. God's men all throughout the Scripture stood up and rebuked the people for what they were doing uh, against God. Go to Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17. Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 17. Another prophet of God. Ezekiel. Ezekiel 3, 17. Son of man... I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. I am, to, as a man of God, to warn you. I am to let you know, yes, if you do walk this particular path, this is what's going to happen to you. If you don't do what God says, this is what's going to happen to you. I am to stand up here and warn you and let you know <clears throat> what God says about what you're doing. Look at Micah chapter 3, verse 8. 
Micah chapter 3, verse 8. Micah chapter 3, verse 8. By the way, I don't want me to throw this in here too. I believe when the preacher's preaching, he ought to be preaching to himself as much as anybody else. Right. Micah chapter 3, verse 8. But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. I am to preach about sin. Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 58. basically says the same thing. Isaiah chapter 58 and verse number 1. Isaiah 58, verse number 1, the Bible says to the preacher, God says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. I am to name them. I am to show them their sins. I'm not just to show them that they're a sinner. I am to show them their sins. What are their sins? The preacher is to to preach uh, and name the sins. There are, a lot, there are a lot of preachers that will talk about, they'll mention sin from the pulpit, but there aren't many left who will name the sin. You see? And by the way, look at what he said in verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. To me, a trumpet, I don't hear many quiet trumpets. You're supposed to shout it. I said to my mom one time, she come and heard me preach, and we were having a potluck dinner afterwards, and I said, Mom, what do you think? She said, too loud, too long. That's what she told me. <clears throat> my unsaved mother told me that. <clears throat> so I told her, sit down, Mom. <laughs> I didn't say that at all. But well, when she told me that, I, I, I said, who asked you? But I, when she told me that, I said, Mom, I'm just doing, I just quoted that verse to her. Doing what the Bible says. That's the way you're supposed to preach. <clears throat> Very weird, uh, unsaved mother, and her favorite preacher was Jack Hiles. Amazing. Anyway, Acts chapter 11, verse 28. Acts chapter 11, verse 28. So I am to, to tell you the gospel. I am to tell you words of encouragement. I am to tell you words of rebuke, words of warning. I am to declare your sins. I am to let you know that that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 28. Paul, the, or, no, I don't think it was Paul here, but let me get there real quick here. Acts chapter 11 and verse number 28. And the Bible talks here about what they what they were preaching about, and it says there stood up one of the, one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius <coughs> Caesar. So he's talking here about the future, the future. I'm to preach to you about the future, the way the future is going to be. I'm to tell you the truth about the future. Hey, if the future doesn't look rosy, then say it. You see. But I'll tell you what, we don't, have a, we don't have a great future here on earth, but we sure got a great future up there. Amen. See, I'm, I'm so thankful for that. We, to tell you, if I'm going to tell you the truth, I've got to be negative about the future of this world. I have to be. But if I'm going to keep telling you the truth, I can be wonderfully optimistic and excited about the truth uh, that the future is great for the Christian. Ezekiel chapter 11, we won't read all those verses. We read <coughs> one of them before. But 5 through 11, Ezekiel 11, 5 through 11 talks about how the pastor, preacher is supposed to talk about judgment, how judgment is coming. It is my job to tell you that judgment is coming for you. You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day. You're going to be ready for that day. It is my job to tell you that as a preacher of God's Word. <coughs> that is a very sobering thought, a very serious thing. We need to make sure that we're ready for the judgment day. You see, it's not just a song that needs to be sung. It's a, it's a message that needs to be preached. Look at Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 7. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 7. Boy, God really addresses to the men of God throughout the Bible what they're supposed to say to the people. And, you know, really, I haven't heard anything yet about, uh, about we're supposed to care about how the people react to it either. Ezekiel 2, verse 7. And thou shalt speak my words unto them. Whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. God says to Ezekiel, speak what I say even if they don't listen. Doesn't matter if they listen or not. Tell them what I say. You see? Now, I'm responsible to get up here and open up the book and rightly divide the word of truth. So preach it. Preach it with urgency. Preach it with passion. Preach it with compassion. Preach it with love. There's no compromise. That's my responsibility. Your responsibility is to receive it. 
I cannot make you receive it. I can only do my part. Your responsibility is to hear it. But God says, whether they listen to you or not, preach it. I mean, if everybody sits in the congregation and goes like this, I'm still supposed to preach it. I haven't had anybody do that yet. But my pastor told me about, my pastor told me about one time he looked out there and he saw this lady go like this. Just obvious to everybody when he looked at her. Like she wasn't going to listen. And a lot of people don't do that with their ears, but they do that with their heart, which is really sad. <clears throat> you know, in Exodus 14, verse 2, Moses even got up and preached to the people about where they were supposed to live. Told them where God wanted them to live. But I'm supposed to show you God's direction for your life, where God wants you to go, what God wants you to do with your life. Look at Job 13, verse 7. Job 13, verse 7. Job chapter 13 and verse number 7. <clears throat> Job is talking to his friends, and, and even though it's a personal conversation, I got to thinking, boy, this is something that, that a man of God is supposed to do, too, because a lot of times uh, questions are asked by the men of God in the Bible to the people when they're preaching. Will you speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for Him? So I know that as a preacher, I am to ask you questions to get you thinking in your mind. Like, I've asked this question before. So you decide you're not going to live for God. You decide you're going to go your own way and do your own thing. Okay, so we know that you believe the judgment's coming. The judgment seat of Christ is coming. What are you going to tell God when you stand before him? Get to thinking. What am I going to tell God? Uh, I told you before, a lady, uh, uh, one of the ladies in our church, I, was, I preached on this certain subject, and, and she said to me, well, I don't believe, I, I'm not doing that. I'm, in other words, I'm to- totally going against what you're preaching, but I'll take it up with God when I face him. Ooh, boy. Boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. <clears throat> I said, you better think twice about that statement because that's not going to fly very good with God. Look at Psalm 119, verse 46. Psalm 119, verse 46. Psalm 119, verse 46. The Bible says here, I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. I will speak publicly. I will speak about God's testimony. I'll speak His Word. I'm just going to speak His Word. And I'm not going to be ashamed at what it says. I'm not going to do that. Psalm 145 says we are to speak of His power, of His glory. We're supposed to speak about the things we need to praise God for. Amen. Proverbs 8 talks about speaking of excellent things, speaking the truth. You see? Are you seeing what an awesome responsibility it is to stand behind this desk and preach? I mean, man, this is, this is a huge thing. Look at John chapter 3, verse 34. John chapter 3, verse 34. John chapter 3 and verse 34. John the Baptist. <clears throat> what a bold preacher he was. Boy, I'd like to have heard him, wouldn't you? I'd love to have heard John the Baptist preach. John 3, 34 says here, For whom God, he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. Okay. <clears throat> A God-sent man speaks the words of God. It's amazing to me. I mean, I, you know what happens. You, you, get all, you don't have a pastor, so you, you, you get, bring a guy in, and, and you like the guy, you like his family, and so you all vote. You say, yeah, this is the man that God has sent to us. God sent this man to us. And then, a month or two later, you leave the church. And what happened to God sent this man to us? You see? I mean, if God sent the man, then you better listen to the man. Because God sent the man, and God speaking the words of God, better pay attention to what he's saying. What Jesus said in John 6, 63, the words that I speak are spirit and truth. Truth. Now, I want you to turn over to Jeremiah chapter 23. I'm giving you a little contrast to that. So, we're seeing here through all these verses that I am supposed to, the man of God, whether it's the pastor, whether it's a, a God-called preacher, is supposed to stand here and give the truth. Okay? Give the truth. Give the truth about how to get to heaven. Give the truth of what an encourage, encouraging God we have. Give the truth of words of rebuke, words of warning. Uh, talk, preach about sins. Talk about the judgment. Talk about the rapture. We're supposed to speak what, 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 uh, what God says, even if people don't listen to us. I mean, we're supposed to do this. And then, you go to Jeremiah chapter 23, and I want you to follow along with me. This is going to be, I want you to be patient and just follow along with me as I read. 
Now, <clears throat> follow along carefully, because I want you to see what God is saying here in this passage. Mine heart within me, starting in verse number 9, Mine heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, like a man whom wine hath overcome, because of the Lord and because of the words of His holiness. For the land is full of adulterers, for because of swearing the land mourneth. <clears throat> the pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up, and their course is evil, and their force is not right. For both prophet and priest are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. God is speaking here. God is speaking. He said, my heart is broken because of the prophets. He says in verse 12, Wherefore their ways shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein, for I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. I have seen, and I have seen following the prophets of Samaria, they prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible thing. They commit adultery and, they, and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers, that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Are, are you seeing, now follow along as I'm, as I'm reading this, see what, how God, intent God is on, on, on his preachers preaching the truth, and how, how upset he gets when a man says he's a man of God and doesn't tell the truth. What an awesome responsibility a preacher has to walk, take his Bible and walk behind a pulpit and preach to God's people. Verse 15, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood and make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own hearts and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, The Lord has said, He shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh in the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come upon you. They're telling these people that even though you walk in the imagination of your own heart, everything's going to be fine. For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord, hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind, it shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return till he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days he shall consider it perfectly. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. My God at hand, saith the Lord, not a God afar of off. Did he hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophets said. That prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, or as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. He that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, that, and like a hammer that breaketh a rock in pieces? God's word is not here to smooth us and tickle our ears. God's word is there, so we will do what he says. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith. Behold, I am against them, them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. And when this people or the prophet or a priest shall ask thee, saying, What is the burden of the Lord? Thou shalt then say unto them, What burden? I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. And as for the prophet and the priest and the people that shall say the burden of the Lord, I will even punish that man and his house. Man, that's scary. Then shall you say, every one to his neighbor and every one to his brother, What hath the Lord answered, and what hath the Lord spoken? And the burden of the Lord shall you mention no more. For every man's word shall be his burden, for he hath perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts our God. Thus shalt thou say to the prophet, What hath the Lord answered thee? And what hath the Lord spoken? 
But since ye say the burden of the Lord, therefore thus saith the Lord, because ye say this word, the burden of the Lord, and I have sent unto you, saying ye shall not say the burden of the Lord, therefore, behold, I, even I, will, will utterly forget you, and I will forsake you in the city that I gave you and your fathers and cast you out of my presence. And I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you and a perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. I don't know how that strikes you. That hits me hard. What an awesome responsibility to make sure I tell you things that God wants you to hear. Not what I want to say. Not my own mind. Not my own opinion. Not my own heart. But what God wants you to hear. And if I don't, I will be judged severely for it. You see that? You see that? That's why when a man of God gets up to speak, I don't sit there and yawn. I don't sit there and flip through my Bible. I don't sit there and write notes in my Bible and write notes to people. I don't let myself fall asleep. I don't let myself fall asleep. Why? That's the man of God up there. He's preaching God's Word, and I've got to hear what he says. Because God is speaking to me. God has a message to to give to me through that man up there. You see, it's an awesome responsibility to preach it. And because of who the man of God is and what he's supposed to say, it's an awesome responsibility for you to listen. So important. That's why I'm not going to miss church. I'm not going to miss church. <clears throat> you know what? They asked me to preach next Sunday at my daughter in law's my daughter in law, my daughter's church. I don't have a daughter in law. I wish I had a son, but I don't. I have three beautiful daughters, one change in pregnancy, but I wish I had a son also. And that means that would give me a daughter-in-law. <clears throat> but my daughter's church, they asked me to speak next Sunday. Now, I originally was just going out there for the, uh, for the ordination. And, and <clears throat> my, my, uh, they wanted me to come and spend time with Jessica so, and, and Eric, so I am going to do that. And then I found out the pastor wanted me to preach, too. Now, yes. but here's the point I'm making. I could have gone out there, if they did not ask me to speak, I could have gone out there this Sunday and said, you know what? No one's around. No one knows. I'm just going to take off. I'm just going to sleep. I need a rest. I'm just going to give myself a day off from church. I'm just going to rest and skip church. And you would never have known the difference. See, you never would have known the difference. <clears throat> but see, to me, God's got something to tell me. Amen. That's why I walk into this building. God's got something to tell me. I'm not going to miss it when the preacher's going to be preaching, even if it's not me. See, I want to hear what God has to say. It's a message from God. That's what, that's what I'm trying to tell you. That's why I read that passage. God is so uh, dead set against men of men saying they're going to tell you what God said when God didn't tell you. He's against men telling, trying to tell you things that aren't going to profit you because they're just going to tell you your own mind. They're going to preach unto you lies. And I'm telling you, I can tell you that God's for everything you're doing. I can tell you all these different things and tickly ears that make you feel good and tell you a bunch of lies. You can walk out of here all fluffy and feeling, feeling really, really great and feel really loved and all that kind of stuff. By God, as you live in your wicked, sinful life, but that wouldn't profit you at all. God wants me to tell you the truth. I'm going to answer to God whether I told you the truth or not. Look at Titus chapter 2, verse 15. Titus chapter 2, verse 15. Titus chapter 2, verse 15. The Bible says, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority that no man despise them. God said, I am to speak with all authority. You know what that means? I have the authority of God when I stand up here and preach God's word. So we better listen. We better pay attention. That's why... That's why um, my pastor, Brother Hiles, he never, when, once preaching started, the doors were closed. Nobody was allowed in at all while the preacher was preaching. And nobody was allowed to leave while the preacher was preaching. Now, you can imagine an auditorium that fe- seated 7,000 people, that somebody in that group's going to want to get up and leave. He's going to have to go to the bathroom or something while he's preaching. But he would, somebody get up and, and start moving toward the end. He said, hey, 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 sit down, sit down. What, does he mean? No, 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 no. He's preaching God's word. He can't let anybody be distracted. He, I, I know how it is. Somebody moves around and you automatically get distracted. See, 
I, you know how many times I, that a pastor can lose control of a crowd? He's got their attention, and all of a sudden something happens, and they turn away from him, so he's got to get them back again. You see, this is too important. This is, this is God's message. If I'm just giving you a speech because I'm trying to win an award for the best speech, who cares whether you hear me or not? But if this really is what we claim it is, uh, the message of God, that we better not get up and use the bathroom, not get up and, and go out and sit out there in the lobby because we, we, we're uncomfortable. No, we got to sit and listen to the man of God speak and hang on every word he says. Because this message is something that's going to be something God wants me to hear and God wants to help me with my life. Acts 4.29, the preacher says, I need boldness as I speak. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. Paul said this, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse number 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. A pastor always enjoys, always appreciates, when, a, when the message is over, somebody walks up to him and says, Pastor, that was a blessing to help me. I'm sure several of you said that to Brother Fugit when he was here. And he appreciates, appreciates that. Any pastor does. But really, you know what? As long as he's happy, that's all it matters. Amen. Because I'm preaching in the sight of God. And if he's happy, then I'm happy. If the whole church goes home mad at me and God says, good job. That's all. That's all I need. That's all I need. And I'm not going to apologize for anything, you see. I am to speak sincerely. I am to speak in the sight of Christ for your edifying. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 17. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 17. God can't call his, his man to be his prophet. He says in verse Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse number 17, <clears throat> he says, Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. You know what he said he would do? He said, if you're worried about their face, he said, I'll confuse you. So don't worry about it. My pastor tells the story of another person. He's out there preaching. He's, he's preaching his heart out. He looks out in the crowd. The lady goes like this. Yeah. While he's preaching. Okay. So, you want to do that? That's fine, but it's not going to bother me. I'm not going to care about your face. Well, I hope they like the sermon. Boy, a preacher says that, he's preaching for the people. See? <clears throat> I hope God likes what I'm going to say, because I want to please Him. But we are to get up and speak all that's commanded, and don't preach according to their faces. Acts chapter 18, verses 9 and 10, Paul Acts chapter 18, verses 9 and 10. The Bible says this. He says, <clears throat> then, sp then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee. No man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. He said, Speak, and hold not thy peace. Say what I tell you to say. And don't hold it back. Any pastor who is going to tell you the truth, We'll tell you that there have been times where he's got up. <clears throat> he usually knows his crowd. He knows basically who's there. He knows he knows a little bit basically about, about their life and what they're doing. <clears throat> and sometimes you get up, you look, at, and you get up preaching, and you come to a point, and you know, boy, if I say this, this person's really going to get mad. And so you are tempted not to say it. You're tempted to say, I'll just skip that better not skip that. I better say it. Don't be afraid of their faces. It doesn't matter. Now, I don't preach according to what's going to make you smile. You know, sometimes, say, sometimes I've been told, well, you're not funny enough. I didn't come up here to be funny. See, my face is funny enough. I don't have to be funny. <clears throat> I didn't come up here to tell jokes. I'm not against preachers telling jokes, but I've heard preachers tell too many jokes. Their whole sermon is a joke sometimes. Really, if I, don't, if I make you laugh, I'm glad about that. I, I, sometimes I want to make you laugh. If I don't make you laugh, that's okay, as long as you got the truth. Yeah. See? 
Psalm 27 says we, we are to stand, stand and preach with no fear. <clears throat> the Lord is on my side. Psalm 118.6. He is my strength, my song, my salvation. Isaiah 12.2 said. <clears throat> 2 Samuel 23.2. The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is in my tongue. His word is in my tongue. Go to Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Again, right in that chapter where he's calling his prophet, his man, to preach his word. And he tells him this. When you preach, the Bible says about Jeremiah, the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Okay, again, I, I want to stop here and underline this, because we seem to read this kind of thing several times. If you believe that, if you believe that, that God puts the words in the preacher's mouth, then you have to ask yourself the question, if you're not doing what the preacher says, how come? If you really believe it. If you don't believe that God puts the words in the preacher's mouth, then you have to ask yourself the question, why am I here? See? So it really comes down to the fact that if you believe that, that you're being preached the word of God, then you make, better make sure you're applying it to your life. But he said here, See, verse 10, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. So God tells Jeremiah, I am sent, sending you to preach, to root out, root out the problems, pull down, pull down the opposition, destroy, destroy the false teaching, throw down <coughs> the false ideas, to build lives and to plant lives. You see, so you're going to handle, I, I've, I've, I've sent you to handle every angle of life, every situation in life. But you're going to make sure you say what I put in your mouth. So <clears throat> I must make sure that I tell you what God says to tell you. He says in Titus 2.15, don't, <clears throat> don't, uh, don't let them despise you while you preach. If I see someone who is in opposition to me, now I know that's happened here before. I've been told before that so and so was, was was ripping you while you were preaching. I didn't know that. If I'd have known that, I'd have said something. I'd have called the person out right there and said something. You do that? Yeah, I would. I'm getting too old to put up with that now. I used to be I used to be a nice guy. <clears throat> but God said, yeah, right. God said, don't let them despise you. Don't let them despise you. See, man, <clears throat> it's amazing. Anyway, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 27. Let's look at that. Wrong. I'm almost finished here. This is what you are to do. I've told you my responsibility. Let me give you this verse, Deuteronomy 5, 27. Deuteronomy 5, 27. Go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say. And speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee. And we will hear it and do it. Amen. Let me read that again. Go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say. And speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee. And we will hear it and do it. Amen. That's your responsibility. Your responsibility is to hear it and do it. Not just hear it, but do it. Both. You see, it's so important. That's why I love practical preaching. That's why you won't hear me get up and talk a lot about prophecy and all that kind of stuff. I'm all for prophecy. I love to read books about prophecy. I, I've taught the whole book of Revelation verse by verse. Um, <clears throat> and But you know what? I'd rather teach you, I'd rather give you the verses in the Bible, the hundreds and thousands of them to tell you how to live. Because if I tell you, if I teach you how to, from the Bible how to live, you'll be ready for any prophetic event that happens. That's right, amen. And that's what I want to do. Amen. See, I could give you, I could teach you a bunch of fun facts of the Bible, and you'd be, say, "Wow, I can't wait to go to Bible study Wednesday night because I'm going to learn more about what the number seven means in the Bible and what the third, the middle verse of the Bible is and the significance of that." I could tell you all that stuff. It's fun facts, but you can read those in a book. When I go to church, I need help in my life. Right, amen. I need help with my life. And that's why I, I was so excited about getting Brother Fugit out here because I knew he'd give you things that would help your life. 
And he did. I was so excited about hearing Brother Swank, Swanky the other day because I knew he'd give me something to help my life. And he did. Practical preaching from God's Word. That's what's so important. Something you can hear and do. Not hear and learn. Hear, learn, and do. That's what we need to do. James 1.22. You need to be a hearer of the Word. <clears throat> Not just a, uh, a hearer of the Word, though, but he also says a doer of the Word. You see? Now, go to uh, Jeremiah chapter 38, verse 20. Jeremiah chapter 38, verse 20. Jeremiah 38 and verse 20. It says here, But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee, and it shall be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee, so shall be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. That's what happens if you obey what, what, what God's man speaks. I'm a new Christian. I'm, this preaching thing's new to me. I'm used to a guy getting up and reading a passage out of the, one of the Gospels, and he's standing up there in a dress, even though he claims to be a man, a father. He calls himself father, but dresses like a mother. I don't understand that. <clears throat> but anyway... Um, and he's telling me all this stuff that have, has nothing to do with my life. So I'm new to this preaching thing. And as I'm, re, I'm new to the Bible, I'm new to the preaching, so I, I don't really know how to react to this preaching because I'm hearing stuff I've never heard before. And then I'm reading the Bible verses like that, that if you hear what I say, hear what I, I give the man something to speak, hear what he says, and then obey it, and it'll be well with you. And I'm reading verses like that, and I'm thinking, man, I need to go to church. I need to listen. I need to listen to what God's man is saying. And I need to apply it to my life. I need to do what God says to do. That's what I need to do. And so <clears throat> that's what he's telling us here. It's my, you're, my responsibility as a listener to listen with all my heart and to do my best to apply it to my life. Now, I'm going to give you one more verse, and we're going to be finished. John 7, 17. John 7, 17. How do I know if the preacher is preaching the truth? Jesus said, John 7, 17, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, or whether I speak of myself. So if you know God's will, if you're doing God's will for your life, then every man who stands up to preach the Bible to you, teaches you doctrine, which is the, the teachings of God, You'll know if he's telling you his words or God's words. So you want, to, you want to know how to make sure you never get fooled? Be in the center of God's will for your life. And you'll know. You'll know. God will reveal it to you. Because someone who's doing God's will, God is not going to let that person sit underneath a man who's going to direct them away from God's will. You see what I mean? So, <clears throat> if I am speaking truth, then you must obey it. And don't feel like, well, you did, somebody says, you just do what the pastor tells you to do. No, I do what God tells me to do. And God uses the pastor to tell me some of the things he wants me to do. But I'm not obeying my pastor. I'm obeying God. My pastor is just a messenger. That's all he is. Just telling me what God says. But if you, if you believe I'm speaking the truth, then do what is being preached. If you don't believe I'm speaking the truth, you got two choices. You either leave or you fire me. One of the two. But you can't just sit here and not do anything about it. I mean, <clears throat> well, we just don't want to challenge. Man, if my pastor's preaching heresy, I'd either get out of there or I'd, I'd get a thing going about getting him out of the, out of the pulpit. Yeah. You see? But I want to tell you something. I may not be much of a Christian, but I know I'm sincere. And I can guarantee you, when I walk behind this pulpit, I'm going to give you truth from God's Word. I'm not going to give you my opinion. My sermon's not going to be based on my opinion. It's going to be based on what the Word of God says. You're going to get the truth. I'm going to feed you the Word of God while you sit there and listen. So if you'll come with, with your heart open you're going to get something from God that's going to profit you. It's going to benefit your life. My heart's desire is when I walk behind this pulpit and open this perfect book is to say, Whatsoever he saith unto me, that will I speak. 
Your attitude ought to be, we will hear it, and we will do it. You see? Wow. There's unity there. The preacher preaches God's word. The, the people, including the preacher himself, hears it and does it. Not too complicated. Not too hard. It's what God tells us to do. And when we're like that, God will bless us. God will bless the church. All right, let's have, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be have an invitation. Thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Thank you for this truth that we talked about tonight. Preaching, Lord. What, a, what an exciting thing to go hear, preaching. To hear God, God's man proclaim God's word. It's just something about it. When you're saved, it's just something about it. It's just so exciting. You get excited about hearing preaching. Lord, I get excited when it's church time. I get excited about going to be with Christians. I get excited about singing the songs and listening to the specials. <clears throat> I get excited about the invitation and what God's going to do. But I really get excited about preaching, about hearing a preacher preach God's Word. Where I'm telling you, it never gets old, it never gets boring. It's exciting because it's God's man telling us what God says. We know, Lord, that <clears throat> your son went to heaven doesn't walk on the earth anymore. He doesn't stand in pulpits and preach. He's now sent your men to do that. And we are. To, and I know it's an awesome responsibility. I really believe that, Lord. It's an awesome responsibility. And I don't take it lightly. I'm supposed to say exactly what you want me to say. Help me always to do that, Lord. Please. And I pray if I don't do that, that you would confound me and confuse me and somehow shut my mouth so I don't say things that are not true. But Lord, I also pray because... The man of God is the messenger of God, preaching the word of God. You'd help us to hear it, take it seriously, and do it. Like the people were told to do in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Help us to make a commitment to that now, Lord. Help us to make a commitment to taking the preaching of God's word seriously and to, and to do what the preacher preaches about. Do what the preacher says. Not because the preacher says it, but because God said it through the preacher. Heads bowed, eyes closed. <clears throat> First responsibility I have is to preach the gospel. And the gospel is, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is a message of salvation, salvation from hell. Jesus Christ died to save us <clears throat> from hell. That's why he went to the cross, because we were sinners on our way to hell. And our only hope is to have our sins paid for before we die. We can't do that. But Jesus can do that. Jesus did do that. He paid for our sins. And if we come to him... And, ask, and, and accept his payment for our sin and receive his, his gift of eternal life. The Bible says because he, he, he was God, come in the flesh, lived a perfect life, went to the cross, paid for our sins, rose from the dead three days later. God said if we will call on him and ask him to save us, that he will give us eternal life. He will save us from hell and give us eternal life. Now, think about that. Have you ever done that? Have you ever asked Jesus to be your personal Savior? Ask, not ask him to save you from your problems, save you from your troubles, Save you from your bad habits. No, ask if you ask them to save you from hell. Who say this morning, this evening, rather, Pastor, I've done that. I remember when I where I was. I remember asking Jesus Christ to save me from hell because I knew I was a sinner and I knew I was headed for hell and I knew my only hope was him, was Jesus Christ and so I asked Him to be my Savior. Who say this, this evening? I remember doing that. I know for sure I'm saved. You may lower your hands. How many say, Pastor? I'm not sure. I'm saved. I'm not sure. I'm going to heaven. I'd like to be sure. But I sit here tonight and I'm doubting that. I don't know if heaven's going to be my home when I die. I want, it to, I want to go to heaven. I'm just not sure I would. If that's you, raise your hand. I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I'd like to be sure, but I'm not sure. In just a moment, we're going to have a song of invitation. And when, we, when the panel begins to play, we're going to stand. If you're not sure you're saved, come up and tell me that tonight. Just say, Pastor, I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven. If you tell me that, well, if somebody take the Bible and show you from the Bible how you can be saved once and for all, get it settled, never doubt it again, that you're going to heaven when you die. If you have been saved, you've not been baptized since you've been saved, you need to do that tonight. Take care of that tonight. Come up and tell me, Pastor, I've not been baptized. I'd like to be baptized. If you want to join the church, come up and tell me, Pastor, I'd like to be a member of the church. We'll be glad to help you do that too. But if God spoke to your heart <coughs> about uh, through the message tonight about the preaching of God's word, and you want to realize, that, and you're going to admit and believe and agree with God, rather, that that is not just... Uh, a man preaching what he thinks, it is the man of God preaching the word of God, preaching it to me. I need to take it as being from God. And then I don't, not only need to hear it, and always be here to hear it, but I need to live it, so I need to do what the preacher is preaching about. If you're going to decide to do that tonight, and you want to make a commitment to 
and not only being a hearer of the word, but a doer of it. Come and tell God that at the altar. We need Christians who are going to commit to not just hearing God's word, but doing it. Just like Monday night about the filling of, of, of the, yielding to the Holy Spirit so we, he can make us into, like, into Jesus Christ, into like Christ. He can conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and the messages we've heard uh, all throughout this year, they need to be changing us because they're not the word of men, they're the word of God. We need to use the altar about what was said tonight. You come and use it. Let's all stand.